again for joining us as we get ready to talk through the health and safety document for Archmere Academy. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Marinelli for a short welcome before we delve into um, sort of the meatiness of, of this health and safety presentation. So Dr. Marinelli, go ahead. Thank you, Katie. I just want to offer a warm welcome to all of you this evening. Um, thank you for being with us on this summer night. Um, but not just for tonight, but thank you for being with us through this whole, uh, what can we call it, ordeal, process, whatever, as we're experiencing uh, day by day changes in what's going on with um, COVID-19 and the pandemic. But I really appreciate that. And I also want to offer a special welcome to families who are new to Archmere. And I appreciate all of you who've chosen to join us uh, and be a part of this journey with us. Um, I always like to think a true test of the strength of a community is when it is tested and how it handles adversity. And um, we have definitely come together to support one another, to offer expertise uh, to each other, and just to offer comfort to each other when we need it. And that's extremely um, gratifying as head of school. Um, I want to thank for the, on this committee in particular, in addition to Mr. Campy and Mrs. Steele who spearheaded it, uh, but we had um, Dr. Scarpacey and uh, Mr. Frasic, our current parents who've offered their expertise in these matters, as well as Dr. Jim Stockman. He's a 61 graduate, former member of the Board of Trustees and former chair of the American Board of Pediatrics. And so we've had some wonderful resources brought to this committee and their thinking to offer what we think is the best possible scenario to have all of our students back on campus safely and healthily, um, but socially and mentally to be able to have them back and celebrate together and be together, uh, we thought was just as important too, as long as it can be done safely and well. So with that kind of overview, um, I'm gonna turn the commentary on the document over to Mrs. Steele, who's intimately in engaged with it, and Mr. Campion. And then I'm happy to, of course, be a part of the Q&A and um, feel free to post questions as we go if you didn't have a chance to send questions in advance. So with that, Mrs. Steele. Great, thanks Dr. Marinelli. Uh, so again, welcome to everyone this evening. Uh, we're really, really thrilled that you're able to join us for sort of the live delivery of this, um, this particular document, which obviously is sort of a culmination of a number of weeks of work, but also we find that um, these are really our guiding principles as we're moving through this planning period, which has certainly been um, you know, rife with difficulty and, and a lot of thoughtfulness. Um, and I really hope that when you sign off from the webinar tonight or you're able to tune in at a later date, uh, that you feel that we really have all of our bases covered. I, I think that we um, have such a thorough plan. Um, I really think it's detail oriented and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you this evening. Um, just a couple um, quick reminders. I know that the email that you all received with this invitation did in fact have um, sort of a note about frequently asked questions. All questions that we did not get to in the webinar or um, that we've received you know, a number of will be posted under a frequently asked questions tab, which will be in the, in the resources page of my Archmere. So please stay tuned for that likely early next week um, as we sort of compile questions from the first webinar on academics and the second webinar on health and safety. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, and share um, this with you. Now, this is a document that you will be receiving via email tomorrow evening um, or tomorrow afternoon, uh, most likely, as soon as the link to this YouTube recording is also uploaded so that we can send it in a streamlined fashion. Uh, Dr. Marinelli and Mr. Campion, you can see this, yes? Yes? Okay, excellent. So our health and safety plans for returning to campus. Uh, now, a good teacher would certainly not read every word of this to their students, so I'm, I am not going to sit here uh, and read it all to you, but I am certainly going to just touch on a few different points um, and sort of talk you through different sections. Uh, Mr. Campion will also be doing this for particular sections that pertain more to the facilities and technology aspects. So if we zoom in here on um, the expectations for families, um, you'll see that the three photos that accompany this particular section, it's all about social distancing, it's all about masks, and it's all about hygiene, right? Making sure that uh, we're using our hand sanitizer frequently, that we're um, washing our hands for long periods of time. So these are three simple things, um, procuring a mask, washing your hands, using hand sanitizer, and then the distancing part, we, we really have um, locked down on our end. A uh, big thank you to 
and Mr. Campion, who's been stripping out extra tables and chairs from certain spaces. We're taking advantage of non-traditional spaces on campus to ensure that all students have a place to be during their free time. And you'll notice that it does say that the masks are part of the dress code. So this is something that students are expected to have just as their computer, uh, or, I'm sorry, their laptop and, um, and also their uh, ID to get in the building. This has been added to the student handbook. Um, and so it is part of the code and will certainly be enforced. Now, I, I am also a realist and I know that wearing a mask for a long period of time can be quite difficult. Um, and so that being said, um, I know that students will have to take mask breaks for drinks, things of that nature. But mask breaks should only be taken when static, so at your own table, um, you know, at that fixed table with your seat, and should never be taken, obviously, when sneezing or coughing, and should never be taken when, when moving around the classroom or moving through the halls. Um, so please make sure that you review that with your son or daughter, that we want to be realistic about this, um, that it, you know, eight hours in a mask is a long time, but that will hopefully encourage students to make use of outdoor spaces and to be really thoughtful about those around them. Obviously, um, not all of us need masks for our own health. Many of us are blessed with good health. Um, but for those that are not, we need to be mindful of who those members are in our community, um, including our faculty and staff members. So I'll let you kind of read through that at a later date once you receive the document. Um, on this right hand side, we have some um, information about temperature checks and also reporting absences. Um, so in terms of temperature checks, we have opted to use the Magnus Health app to take our daily temperatures um, and also do a short questionnaire. The Magnus app, the good news is that you all already have Magnus accounts because that's the account that you use to submit your son or daughter's physical forms for participation in athletics. So this is no additional charge. Um, it's something that the that Magnus is including in our contract that we have with them. And so it should be a very seamless process and you will be receiving comprehensive instructions and information from our nurse, Mrs. Becky Hendrickson, um, in the near future. So at the end of the presentation, downloading the Magnus app is part of the sort of uh, checklist of things to do for families, but please know that there will be forthcoming information on that issue. Uh, so we're, we're, we are asking that each family have an FDA approved thermometer at home, um, ideally one of the FDA approved temporal thermometers. That's what we'll also have on campus. Um, and we're asking families to submit this questionnaire on a daily basis. For those who uh, may miss a day, um, our, our nurse, Mrs. Hendrickson, will have access to that data and then we'll be able to prompt that student to come down to the office to fill out their form. Um, so again, more information um, on that to come. And I will walk through this decision tree uh, in just a moment after we talk about reporting illnesses and absences. So before we move on to the decision tree, um, in terms of reporting absences for non-COVID related instances, nothing has changed. You will still call the school number. Uh, you'll still dial extension 811. For some reason you can't get through there or leave a message, 700 is, is sort of the regular extension. But for COVID related absences or positive tests, when it comes to a COVID test, we are asking that you email Mrs. Hendrickson, the nurse, individually. So that's a separate reporting that needs to happen. This is essentially so that Archmere can abide by all of the Delaware um, Health Department's mandates when it comes to contact tracing and reporting. We did receive a number of questions in the pre-registration regarding contact tracing. I was on a call yesterday with some state health representatives and, <clears throat> excuse me, they're quite confident um, that they will be able to provide schools with independent and individual mandates of what needs to happen. Um, what that looks like is going to be a bit up in the air until that issue presents itself, obviously. I apologize that I don't have more in-depth information, but a lot of that reporting and the contact tracing will sort of be on a school by school and case by case basis as you'll see on the decision tree, which we're about to talk about. Um, you'll notice in the last paragraph on that page, if a student falls ill during the day, we do have extra space. Um, we, we have sort of uh, earmarked certain space on campus where students would be able to wait for a family member to pick them up if necessary. And we've also revamped the organization of the nurse's office to make sure that students are safe and well during the day. So moving on to our next page, which I feel like is the crux of this document, and I don't want to talk through each point, but I, I do um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Carl. I'm skipping right over your cleaning procedure. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Campion, let me zoom in on this and give you some time to, uh, to speak to the cleaning procedure. Thank you, Mrs. Thiel. Um, good evening. We have been deep cleaning since March, uh, and we continue to keep all of the areas clean. Um, the plan moving forward is to do the nightly cleaning as, as we've been doing, and we will be cleaning uh, the touch points throughout the campus during the day. Um, myself and the facility staff will assist our day porter, who is part of our cleaning contract, to um, make sure that all those points are, are, are covered during the day. This would include the, the seating in the cafeteria uh, when students uh, have lunch. Uh, in the classrooms, we will be sure to have uh, wipes available for the teachers, as well as bottles of hand sanitizer. Um, we've, I've been stockpiling them for the last month, and we will, we will maintain those. We do also have um, uh, stations, hand sanitizing stations mounted on walls or on, or on stands throughout the campus. So we're ever di diligent on, on that, those protocols. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Campion. So now getting into our, um, our next page, which is this um, decision tree. And we wanted to create a nice visual to sort of guide families through an instance. You know, every morning I'm taking my child's temperature um, and I'm having them answer a series of questions. So if my child's temperature is under 100.4, not 104, but 100.4, and they've answered no to all of the health questions, then you will follow the yes um, sort of column or flow chart um, to indicate that if they are comfortable coming to school, that means that they would attend classes as usual and we are prepared to welcome them physically. Um, a quick statistic based on uh, our scheduling, 95% of our course sections will be under 10 students. Um, so that's a really amazing feat when we're thinking about social distancing, which all of the health professionals are really saying that it's about that and it's about masks. And so we're, we're certainly uh, far exceeding the state standards that have been rolled out. Now, if the answer is no to this initial question, uh, that's where things get a bit more complicated, obviously. Um, that's where we are um, getting in touch with our, our physician, our family doctor. Uh, we're seeing if a COVID test is recommended. Um, and then based on either a positive or negative result, um, we're making sure that we're checking off the things in, in either column. Now you'll notice towards the very bottom, uh, there are some notes about retesting and there's also um, sort of a more general note that it's always better safe than sorry in the era in, the era in which we are living, um, that we would prefer that you err on the side of caution um, rather than, than forcing students to campus because we have this backup option of using the classroom cameras. So there's no need for students to feel that they're missing out on content, that there's going to be gaps in learning. We've, Mr. Campion has invested a large amount of, of time and resources into making sure that our students can have that seamless delivery from afar, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, I also want to uh, draw your attention to the sibling comment that if a student receives a positive COVID test, all siblings must remain at home to quarantine as well. Um, so I know we do have a lot of families with multiple students uh, here on campus. Uh, so we wanna be mindful of that as well, that this also might, might mean a quarantine for your family, not just for one particular individual. You also notice that a note from uh, the, phys the physician is actually mandated to come back to school. So Mrs. Hendrickson, again, will be the point person for those. Um, I know that this, um, this document, there's a lot to peruse and, and a lot of details to look over. So I will certainly have you all do that on your own time. But I hope that this is helpful in helping your family arrive at the correct decision for your son or daughter each day before sending them to school. And the more that we can all buy into this as a community, hopefully the, the longer we're able to sustain the in-person instruction. I'm gonna turn it uh, back over to, to Mr. Campion to talk about the remote and virtual options. And then I'll add a little closing comment about the logistics of, the, of this once Mr. Campion is, is finished. Thanks again. Um, we, uh, as Mrs. Thiel said, we uh, back in June um, worked with one of our vendors to, um, to, to purchase um, a high-end PTZ, ca PTZ camera that would give the teacher the ability to zoom and, and zoom in, zoom out, and, and rotate the camera that we will either have ceiling mounted 
we're mounted in the back of the room. So it'll be a more, it won't be an experience like this evening where the three of us are looking into the camera built into our laptops. It'll be a much sharper image. We are also going to, from that camera, uh, ceiling mount uh, a microphone. I read a review where the audio in a, in a, in a session like this is as, is as important as the video. So we're hoping to have a, a, a quality of audio that we, um, that I, I know we're going to obtain. Obviously, a lot of these things are constrained. So we have delivery dates for September as, as much as I've been asking and asking and asking, but we are just in the queue with a lot of other institutions waiting for these, these very good cameras. And as soon as we receive them, we will install them as quickly as possible so that we are prepared in all 40 plus uh, academic spaces throughout the campus to provide this option. And since we do have licensed Zoom um, accounts for all our faculty and staff, we are able to record uh, in the cloud and um, it, it, it's worked out, as we know from the spring, as, as a good uh, unified platform for us uh, in, through our academic program. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mr. Campion. Um, the last note that I just want to draw your attention to in this last uh, small paragraph under the remote, virtual, and hybrid options, um, I want to draw your attention to who to contact if you're interested in having an extended period of time at home for your son or daughter. So if you're looking to take advantage of the virtual option for, let's say, a week, two weeks, a month at a time, we're asking you to contact Bob Nawazik, our Director of Student Life, and he will keep that running list for attendance purposes. We are still working with our learning management system, Blackboard, which we fondly call my Archmere. Um, we're still working with them to see if there is a, a, an additional classification that we can have for taking attendance, which would essentially be present, absent, or virtual. Um, we have not yet worked that out with them. We're hoping that they will develop the technology for us to do that. Um, so please stay tuned for more information if your son or daughter is simply looking to take advantage of like one day virtually. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. Now transportation. Um, Again, this I would direct all major questions regarding transportation to um, Mr. Lutz or Mr. Cirillo, and I, I know I mentioned that in the last webinar as well, um, but we are doing 50% capacity for all of our um, in-house transportation, uh, but those coming from Pennsylvania, the mandates have been a bit different. Um, you know, I've, I've read via the PA districts that a lot of them are not sure that they can accommodate the 50%, um, and a lot of them will simply be doing 100% with masks on filling back to front. Um, so I would ask that you reach out to your uh, individual district with whom you work, uh, in which you live, um, to make sure that that's a plan that you feel comfortable with. We also understand that this year there might be an uptick in, in families perhaps carpooling with a family they trust, uh, perhaps driving their own son or daughter to school. Um, so we know that there's going to be some shifts and we would just ask that you stay in touch with us or stay in touch with your district should there be changes to your transportation plan that you would traditionally make use of. Okay, moving on here. Okay, arrival to campus. So we just talked about uh, transportation. Now let's talk about what that looks like first thing in the morning. Um, so we have a lot of students who tend to get to campus quite early, uh, whether that be to spend time with friends, enjoy a leisurely breakfast, uh, get some work done. And we totally understand that that is something that um, each family, you know, they have different needs when it comes to that. Um, we are encouraging students, if they can, to get to campus just before your 8.05 class, before your first period class. That will certainly mitigate any crowding that we would have traditionally had, though the seating will not be there for crowding. All seating will be fixed, all seating will be distanced by six feet, um, so that's obviously not an option. Um, but we, we understand that there may be some students who still need to take advantage of that, you know, 7.15 to 8 a.m. window because mom or dad is dropping them off and, and they're sort of at the mercy of, of that person's schedule. So we will still have the socially distanced seating in the SLC available, but when flexible, we would encourage students to arrive just before their class begins. Now you'll also see that locker use is something that we will be taking away this year. We simply 
don't think we can find a safe way to have students uh, crowding in those areas, which tend to be quite condensed to begin with. Um, those locker commons, obviously, will still be there physically. We've actually encouraged uh, teachers, you know, if they have maybe group work that they could be doing outside the classroom, um, we could certainly make use of those spaces in the halls. Um, but that being said, the lockers will not be used. This should be much simpler this year because students only have three to four classes a day. So there's uh, you know, far less materials that they should be bringing with them in a physical capacity. And many of our departments have shifted to online texts. And so we would ask that using the e-text and virtual text as much as possible or as much as you're able uh, will obviously be a good solution for this year. Um, but this will really force students to sort of uncrowd those backpacks and, and stop carrying all of those heavy textbooks with them. Now classroom procedure, we already alluded to this in the previous webinar, but for those of you who are unable to join, we have essentially split every single roster in half. And this allows us to still have the same amount of contact time in each period of the class with students, um, but we're making sure that distancing is still a priority. Um, so as I, I said earlier in the webinar, 95% of our courses will have less than 10 students in them. And so that's a, not only a fabulous um, statistic when it comes to uh, indiv individual contact with the teacher, um, but it's also an excellent statistic when it comes to the health and safety of our students. Now you'll see that um, we, we are obviously trying to make use of every inch of campus, uh, even those that we would not typically or traditionally use on a school day. Um, but all of those will also incorporate distancing. And if students are choosing to spend time outside, which we would certainly encourage them to do, um, that's the only place where they can take off their masks fully, but distancing still needs to remain in effect. Um, the communal spaces on campus, I don't want to delve into this too much because I think you're, you know, freshman parents, hopefully you've been on campus at least once. Um, the others, uh, you know, our sophomore, junior and senior parents, you've seen how much space we have on campus. Uh, we've been very lucky that we have uh, dumped some, some resources into securing Adirondack chairs. Um, Mr. Campion and his facilities team are putting some round tables under the colonnade of the SLC. We're really trying to maximize as much of the outdoor space with actual seating as you know, as possible. That being said, there's nothing stopping a student from, you know, maybe bringing a, a blanket or something of that nature and, and eating their lunch outside, right? We're, we're very blessed with the physical plant that we have, um, and we hope that students will take advantage of it because it is the safest place to be. Um, between classes, we got a few questions about sort of how will this go, you know, the, the flow between periods and things like that. Uh, we have left our circulation time the same in between classes, which is really not very much. It's uh, four minutes, which if you're trekking from the science lecture hall all the way over to St. Norbert Hall, that's actually quite a walk. Um, so students uh, will understand that they are not to stop or congregate in the halls. There can be no taking off of masks as they are moving from class to class. Um, and we've also designated um, up and down staircases in the buildings where that's pertinent. Um, those are indicated here and there will also be very clear signage. I think we've all been a little bit more cognizant of those types of signs, you know, the do not enter one way, the feet on the ground. Um, so please have your son or daughter look for those as they're meandering around campus. But this is going to be a very efficient passing of classes uh, without socialization. Um, not to say that a wave is not allowed, but no stopping to chat in the halls. Um, I've been telling students, just like driving, right? Stay on the right side of the hall, just like you would stay on the right side of the road, um, and we will be in good shape. The Wednesday schedule. Um, so there will be more information to come on this. We actually don't have our first traditional Wednesday or C-Day schedule until the third week of school because we start school with two four-day weeks. So September 16th is actually the first of this unique day that we're going to offer for students. I can tell you that there will be five large blocks of time when um, health classes, science labs, college seminar courses, all of those are happening. Um, but additionally, we've also hired a yoga and meditation instructor to come in for a few sessions a day. We'll be offering some running and walking of the track. So if you plan to take advantage of those wellness offerings, you need to come dressed for them. There will not be an opportunity to change in the locker rooms. So if your son or daughter plans to um, take that yoga yoga course and sign up in advance. They need to come dressed for the occasion. Wednesday will be the tag day that we would have traditionally had on a Friday. 
Wednesday will also be the day for us to, to gather uh, in smaller community groups for things like masses, other liturgical offerings. Um, we'll have some community service uh, projects on campus and sort of send them out to the greater community in trying to still serve um, the needs of others in the way that we would have traditionally done by visiting those sites in a physical capacity. An additional um, note about Wednesdays, obviously students are going to have a number of free, free periods during their, their normal schedule. So we're really hoping that that will empower and encourage students to reach out to their counselors, reach out to their teachers whenever they're in need of extra help, whether that be mentally or academically. Um, so we really feel that this schedule helps us to leverage some of those needs and uh, to make sure that students are really in touch with those who are able to, to best serve their needs um, on campus. And so um, mental health, we know coming out of the COVID era is something um, that is really is pushing schools to get back into it and something we've heard from doctors again and again that the needed social interaction is really such um, a paramount part of going to school right and being in that academic environment and so that's something that we feel really um, proud of that we're able to serve the needs of our students in that way. Okay, um, kind of finishing up here and then we will um, move into some questions. Um, so visitors and the use of campus by outside groups. Um, unfortunately, for the time being, uh, those that live in Delaware know that the special event cap is sort of still in, in effect. Um, no more than 200 groups of 250 gathering together, even in an outdoor space. Um, we, we really want to err on the side of caution when it comes to visitors coming um, from outside. And you'll notice that that, um, that second line says that colleges and universities have all opted to conduct those visits virtually. That really cuts down on the, the number of daily visitors we would have normally welcomed to campus. For parents that do have um, an incoming, um, I, I should say a current eighth grader, we know that shadow visits are something that mean a lot to you. Um, we will certainly reevaluate that policy as we move through the year, uh, but we really want um, to sort of give priority to our students who are on campus, our teachers, our staff, and make sure that things are, are running smoothly, moving smoothly as, um, as we get going. We wanna make sure we get this right before we add in an additional layer. Um, the same thing will, will go for um, large parent group meetings, events, things of that nature. For the time being, um, we're going to be holding those virtually. So parent nights will be held virtually to avoid large groups congregating in the theater as we traditionally would have. Um, and also um, we'll hold as, as many things perhaps later in the spring or, or when time allows when we feel a bit more confident about the health situation moving forward for large groups gathering together. Our food service provider, Sage, um, they have been incredibly, incredibly organized and proactive with their food plan. Um, I met with Chef Jackie um, on Friday for, for a long period of time just to sort of hear about all of their initiatives and they really have it down to a science. There are some things that are changing. There's a lot that's changing when it comes to food service, but it will not take away from all of the strengths um, that Sage brings to the table. So everything will be grab and go style. Uh, there was a pre-submitted question about food allergies. All um, food containers will actually have stickers on the front that indicate what allergies uh, those are not good for. So there will, there will be really clear communication visually um, on the front of, of that box. We are encouraging students to download the Sage app because all of the food menus from now until December are actually already posted on the app so that students can make their choice before they enter the canteen. Um, obviously, we are not going to be able to be milling about, sort of taking in all of our choices in the same way that we would have without holding up the group. So we ask students to be proactive about making their decision ahead of time, enter the canteen by using hand sanitizer that's provided on the outside entrance, grab their food, check out, and find a, a place to sit. Now you'll notice that um, the services are a little bit different this year. Um, the lunch service is just as long as it always was. It runs from 1030 in the morning until one in the afternoon. Breakfast is a bit more truncated. It's going to be from 730 to 815. Now the major difference between uh, last year and this year is that students will not be able to access SAGE in between the meal times. So that space will actually be physically cleaned for um, a rigorous cleaning 
between those services. So that means that if your son or daughter was um, sort of in the habit of buying something for after school, you know, uh, maybe around 2.30 or 3 o'clock before Sage closed, they need to be a bit more proactive about making those decisions or coming prepared with their own snacks because after 1 o'clock, Sage will not be offering snacks, milkshakes, things of that nature. Again, they've been incredibly thorough. Um, I have a document that I will actually be sending out um, via Mrs. Zugahar tomorrow. So that will give you even more information um, about the food service. And again, the, the name of that app is right there, the Touch of Stage mobile app. So students should go ahead and download that from the App Store. When it comes to athletics, I wish I had more to report. And I know Mr. Oswinkle feels the same way. Uh, we've been on the phone pretty much every other day, just sort of checking in. I will tell you that we are not going to be starting athletics on time. So if that is something that, um, you know, sort of affects your, your plans as a family, please know that we will not be starting training camps on uh, August 17th. Right now, the most likely course of action seems to be a delayed start to athletics, but I'm not going to offer any more information at the moment because none of it seems particularly clear. Um, and, and so I want to make sure that we get you the right answers. Um, but I can at least say that we will not be starting athletics on time. Uh, the likely course of action is a delayed start for our, our, our region and our conference. So this last page here, um, just sort of gives some information on our, on our guiding principles. Um, Dr. Marinelli, I'm just gonna skip ahead to the last page and explain this before I turn it back over for any um, concluding remarks that you have before we do some Q&A. Um, the very last page of this packet, the health and safety document, we are asking that you thoroughly read through this with your son or daughter and acknowledge that you understand your responsibilities here within. Um, I feel really proud of all of the hard work and the time and the energy that we've been putting in at Archmere. Um, and we are asking that you join us in attempting to get back to campus in the safest way possible. Um, yesterday, we got obviously some good news from the governor uh, in the sense that um, we, are, we are able to open, um, schools are able to sort of make the decision that is right for them under scenario two, the hybrid option. Um, and we feel very confident about the precautions that we have in place. But we also know that we have families coming from a number of different regions. And so we need your help on your end um, in, in maintaining the health and safety precautions that we have outlined here. Um, and so we thank you in advance for that. Uh, we look forward to receiving this form either scanned or by mail. Um, and the, the directions um, at the bottom will indicate that you should send that to uh, Mrs. Linda Carney, who is working full time in our main office at the moment. And she will happily receive that and then check your name off the list. Um, so I'll, I'll go back here uh, just to this final statement. And Dr. Marinelli, did you have any closing remarks before we take some questions? I just wanted to, um, well, first of all, thank you um, again, Mrs. Seal and Mr. Campion for spearheading this effort. And I think it was a comprehensive conversation. And as you said, it, it's continuing to evolve. These are our best, our best scenarios. And uh, I, I would just conclude by saying with all, of, all these plans, um, there were these three things in mind. First of all, the, the physical and mental health and safety of the students and staff, and of course, your families. Um, the second was to sustain a sense of community so that everyone feels connected. And the third was to obviously have um, a challenging and engaging academic experience, right? That's, that's our primary mission and goal. And it's a balancing act by you know, trying to address the, uniqueness situ the unique situations of each family, but also uh, as Mrs. Steele said, in a communal way, we all have to kind of, you know, toe the line, so to speak. We all have to do this or agree to do the same kinds of things, particularly around health and hygiene. So I really appreciate everybody's cooperation in advance to get us to a point where we start to develop a community where we feel safer and safer each day because we're all, you know, following uh, the appropriate guidelines to make it that way. And, but we, and we certainly understand uh, individual preferences or maybe even circumstances as Mrs. Steele touched on, you know, if, if anybody's feeling hesitant uh, or concerned about coming to school on a particular day, we think we've addressed that with this hybrid, um, uh, you know, situation or hybrid option, uh, which will continue. So um, hopefully this has been, you know, a good conversation and by no means has it ended. And I know I see some questions on the, um, on the board and so maybe we can just go right to the questions at this point. Um, but I just wanna say thank you, everyone. The first question um, was um, that I saw 
if if the if the weather's inclement um, and we have these outdoor spaces, what's sort of the plan in place? Do students have other indoor places to go? A great question. So, um, Mr. Campy and I, we actually walked the campus with Mr. Nawazik um, not long ago, creating a document essentially of max capacities of every space on campus indoors. Um, and it is incredible how many how many students our building could hold, um, you know, even with the social distancing measures in place. I feel confident that with the use of non-traditional spaces that we will be fine on a rainy day, um, even if that means sort of moving students into the theater in a socially distanced way, um, maybe making use of the gym. But to be honest, with the counts that we have for, for other indoor spaces that are sort of more um, conducive to studying and, and independent work and, and quiet reading, I feel very, very confident about our ability to do that. Obviously, um, it might take some tweaking, you know, on a, on a rainy day, we might have to throw some tables and chairs in a space we weren't anticipating. Um, but based on our numbers, I feel good about that. Thank you, Keith. Another question is, uh, would students or will students and families be notified if they should be in contact with a COVID positive student or staff member and how might that be, you know, process um, happen? So that's a great question. So um, obviously you would report any cases that are positive in your family when it comes to your son or daughter to Mrs. Hendrickson, who would then report to the Division of Public Health. Um, we would then follow the CDC and Division of Public Health mandates. Um, you know, if there is, for instance, um, an uptick, the Delaware of Public Health would keep a close eye on who we might be able to uh, sort of tell within the community. That being said, doctors and nurses have been pretty realistic about the fact that in a high school setting, it's going to be quite difficult, um, not just at our Schmier, but contact tracing will be difficult just given the, the sheer number of places that a student has been um, and also you know, what they're doing in their free time as well. So we will follow that guidance. Um, and then in terms of communication, that will be something that we'll sort of handle on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Another question is, shouldn't fall sports just be canceled to minimize risks? And I know that's an ongoing question. Yeah, it's an ongoing question. I will say, um, you know, Mr. Oswinkle and I have, have set, used the phrase, we are a school that offers athletics. We are not an athletic program that offers school, right? So school is, is the thing that takes precedent. We want to get it right academically for our students. And of course, it's our hope that we can offer those extracurriculars, um, but only if it's safe and only if it's not going to compromise the academic integrity and ability to be on campus. Okay. Questions about virtual classes, will they be recorded so students might watch them later? So that's a great question. So we want to encourage students to come for the live session if they are able. Um, the whole point of investing in these high tech cameras and microphones is so that students could feel part of that community, that classroom community space. That being said, we understand that there are students who may be ill who are not able to tune in. Um, so we, we can certainly offer um, those uh, recordings, but certainly the first option um, would always be to tune in during your regularly scheduled time so that you have some peer-to-peer -peer interaction uh, virtually and also some face-to-face uh, -face with your teacher, which is nice. More on the virtual, just clarifications about the virtual and hybrid options. If a student won't be excused from school, it says students won't be excused from school if they stay home for personal safety reasons. Um, is that considered an unexcused absence if they log in via Zoom for classes that day or only if they don't log in? But, so, to, but yeah. Only if they don't log in. So right. that's why we're hoping to have that, um, that virtual option on our learning management system so that we could check them in for that particular session. Um, that being said, stay tuned for more information on exactly how that's going to work. Um, but please know that we are going to be compassionate when it comes to um, the option to stay home and sort of that, that, that will impact attendance in a way um, that a, a traditional unexcused absence would. Mm -hmm. um, another question, they, they, these keep uh, jumping around a bit. Um, about using the apps, uh, can, can students use their phones to check on, say, the Sage app or the Magnus app while they're on campus? 
So that's a great question. Um, obviously, we don't encourage the use of um, phones in the classroom, um, but I think that we could certainly make some exceptions um, and, and extend some compassion for the time that's free in the lounges and things of that nature. Um, they should also, Mr. Campion, be able to access the Sage app, I would think, via, via their laptops as well. I'd have to check with, with Chef Jackie about that. Um, I don't know if you know that answer. I, I don't. I would assume that there's a web interface that they could log into, um, I, I, I would think. I will, I will look into that and hopefully be able to offer some information uh, in the email that's forthcoming tomorrow with all of this information. I'll look on this other computer. Uh, uh, that we're we're on a little bit on sports. Will sports credits still be a graduation requirement or would they be decreased? Or, And I think we discussed this with Mr. Um, Doherty, but you can certainly answer that. Sure, yeah. Again, we will be very flexible, very compassionate about this. We understand that this COVID is the biggest extenuating circumstance I think we've ever dealt with. Um, and, and so that being said, um, when it comes to the sports credit, that's certainly not high up on, on our list of priorities. Um, so we will be flexible. Mm -hmm. On the remote learning, Mrs. Thiel, if, if a student is at home participating, will they be, act be able to actively engage in the class by asking questions, et cetera? Mr. Campion, do you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, we are the the Zoom platform will allow for that interaction um, for the student to. I believe there's a a student can raise their hand virtually and, and, and draw attention. So, again, the goal of the cameras uh, is to to create a scenario where the student at home will interact with the teacher and some of the classmates as well. So, I think there there will be that ability to to interact in a, in a, in a two-way two interaction. Um, another question uh, about face masks. Uh, will faculty also be wearing face masks? So great question. So when faculty are out and about on campus, yes, they will still have that, those same rules in effect. Um, we did get a shipment of PPE from uh, the state, essentially, um, that sort of in line with our population. And so teachers will actually wear face shields while they're teaching to really allow for students to hear their enunciation, to soak in what it is they're saying. Um, but teachers will know that the circulation while wearing face masks is something that, that or face shields, I'm sorry, um, is something that we need to, to consider. So we still, with a face shield, cannot be sort of leaning over students um, because it's not quite as protective as the face mask. I will say that um, I've been in close contact with friends who live um, in Europe, uh, who, I, who I met while um, working abroad, and their kids have gone back to school with just the face shields, and they've had a lot of success. Um, so I feel good about the teachers wearing the face shields, but they will also have masks um, when in close contact with students or when circulating around campus. Mm -hmm. um, question about Governor Carney's uh, announcement about hybrid learning in the state and permitted, how, how does that affect us? How are we interpreting that regarding our own particular plan? Great question. So yesterday, one of the journalists um, in the presentation by Mr. Carney uh, specifically asked the question, like, is there a threshold? Is there a number? Is there a, a number of you know, acres of campus space that you're, you're willing to sort of draw a line in the sand? And his answer was no, that, that schools have to do what's right for them, that no school is an apples to apples comparison. Um, and so if they have a large physical plant, if they have a low number of students and feel that they can um, implement a, an in-person model safely, then that they should feel free to do so. Um, so all of that was good news for Archmere um, in terms of um, Governor Carney's announcement. Yes. Um, types of masks. Are there guidelines about the type of masks? Uh, we know we have Archmere masks um, available, but any regulations on that? Sure. Um, so in terms of the Archmere masks, just a quick plug for those. Um, they have not quite arrived, but they should be here any day. Um, and then I'll be coordinating with um, the wonderful mothers who work in the varsity shop and the fathers as well um, to see if they want to do a pre-order, if they want to sell them in person. Um, so we'll, we're kind of working out how to disseminate them uh, once we get them in. But I'm excited for you to see them. Many of them were designed by a student, um, which is, is really exciting. Um, when it comes to masks that cannot be used, there is a particular type of N95 mask that contractors wear that does nothing but um, 
filter the air that's coming in. Um, and we obviously need to filter the air that's going out. So that is the only type of mask that would not be allowed. Um, and so that's not a standard N95 mask. It's a particular type that's used for contractors. Um, the name is totally escaping me at the moment, um, but I don't think that that would be one that we would be encountering anyway. So maybe combine these couple of questions because they're around the Wednesday schedule. Uh, one was around how will clubs work? A second one was if a student chooses to stay at home virtually part-time, can they come in on Wednesdays and do labs? And there was a similar question about if, if, a, if a student is staying at home uh, by choice to do virtual classes, I'm assuming, but they're healthy, can they come in on a Wednesday and participate in actual physical labs? That's a great question. Um, when it comes to being required to attend labs, if you are opting to stay home, the answer would be no. We want you to make the decision that's obviously best for the health and safety of your family. Um, I actually had not considered the, the reverse of that. You know, coming in to do the physical lab, I, I totally understand that that's, you know, a, a more limited group of students that they're coming into contact with. Um, I see no problem with that as long as, as the student is abiding by um, the rules and regulations in the health and safety document, wearing their mask and in, in the lab wearing gloves, which will be provided as well. Mm -hmm. Question about delayed testing results. Now in PA, they're saying about a six to 10 day delay. How might that be negotiated and handled if symptoms go away even before results are returned? Mm, great question. Oh, and I don't know that I have the answer to that one, unfortunately. Um, so maybe this is actually a good opportunity to talk about um, just sort of more broadly testing in general, because one of the questions that we got ahead of time was, are tests going to be mandated for students ahead of time? The answer is no, that the state is not mandating, nor are they, are they administering tests like sort of for blanket community of individuals. They are, however, providing tests for the faculty and staff before school uh, begins, and then on a weekly basis for rotating cohorts of faculty and staff. That being said, um, one of the pieces of information that will be sent in this email of information tomorrow is the link for the Delaware testing sites. Um, they are committed to ramping up the number, and in Delaware, the results have been incredibly quick. Um, I live in Pennsylvania, and I am quite jealous of the turnaround time um, that Delawareans have had when it comes to the COVID testing. Um, so we feel confident that, uh, or I should say the state feels very confident that they will be able to handle um, the influx of students coming in prior to, to going to their individual campuses. Um, so that's going to be a family choice. If you'd like your student to be tested before they come to campus, campus, you'll need to seek out one of the community centers, and I will include that link. Um, Michael, I don't know that I answered your question, though, that you asked. Um, oh, with the delay, the testing delay. Yeah. So you'll, that. You will see in the decision tree that you, your student cannot come back until the results have come in. So even if symptoms are, are sort of you know, wearing off, um, they need that, that negative test um, and, and the, the fever and symptoms and signs need to, um, to subside. It's a good follow-up question. Will students in PA be able to get tested in Delaware? Uh, and there was something of a conversation around this, right? So I, all signs point to yes. There was a comment made in a webinar I was on yesterday that talked about students coming from New Jersey um, and coming from Pennsylvania. Michael, I don't, Michael or Carl, I don't know if there's additional information you have, but last I heard the answer would be yes. My understanding with regard to that and also with the uh, quarantines that some states have put on Delaware residents um, was that uh, as long as you're enrolled in a Delaware school, you would be eligible, I thought you would be eligible for testing, I'm not as clear about that one, but certainly you're able to commute back and forth between those states because you'd be considered like an essential employee in a company and you're technically going from your home to school, school to home. So that I do know. I, I, I do know that there was an initiative in Newcastle County to have all students tested, which they've sort of did not move forward with, but even in that initiative, they were including any student who was in a Delaware school, regardless of their residency. So in that same vein, that might be the case. Um, let me see, a few more. Food services available and unchanged. I think we touched on that. Um, yes, they would be, but you know, we said a grab and go setup. Anything more to say there? 
and oh. just no service in between meals. That's going to be the one difference. There's no continuous service for the whole day. Just 7.15, uh, I'm sorry, 7.30 to 8.15 for breakfast, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. for lunch, which should really mitigate any kind of backup in the lunchroom when you've got two and a half hours to get in there and, and grab your lunch. But if students, if students for various physical or health reasons have to eat every so often, um, as you said, it would be probably be good to pre-plan with a snack in the afternoon at three, particularly if they're going on to extracurriculars after school or some other thing where they're not going to have access to, to food. So that would be the, the timeline there. Um, if sports do take place, will they have access to locker rooms to change for sports? I guess that's a Mr. Campion question about facilities use. Uh, I would presume so, but I don't know. Uh, I, I would presume so, but they, I'm going to assume that they'd have to be metered in some way and maybe every other locker would be available. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously we would do the cleaning on a daily basis in those areas, which we, which we already do. Right. Um, questions about upcoming events like the uh, new student orientation on the 25th, 26th about um, uh, the mini roster night. Are these things happening and how are they happening? Yes. Uh, so great question. So orientation, uh, good news for freshman families that uh, we will be offering orientation, uh, a bit of a truncated version. It's actually going to run from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. on two separate days. And that's so we can protect the integrity of the small group sizes and also the freshman and senior buddy system, which is really, um, I think, one of the most sort of time-honored traditions when it comes to our orientation programming. So stay tuned for more information coming from admissions. Um, half of the alphabet will be the 25th, half the alphabet will be the 26th with their senior buddy. Um, and then Dr. Marinelli, mini, mini roster night, you said. Um, yeah. so mini roster night will actually be offered virtually, more or less like the course fair that we offered for students in a virtual um, model this year. Um, so I think that will actually uh, really encourage faculty innovation. Um, and I'm also excited for you to be able to watch those videos um, for a long time because they're things that often highlight what's going on in the classroom. And so that will be an exciting opportunity for us to document that. Um, so just some questions about classes, maybe. Uh, we can group these together. Um, how do we participate in jazz ensemble safely? Um, and uh, related to that, art classes, how will they be organized? Maybe you could talk a about those for a couple. Sure. So, Mr. Campion, sure. if I forget anything, you let, sure. let me know. But um, in terms of art classes, we've expanded um, the art building to essentially encompass the science lecture hall as well, which is just across the walkway. So very easy to access for our art teachers and art students. Uh, Mr. Campion and his facilities team have generously, um, you know, sort of reorganized the room and also are going to be installing some shelving so that art teachers have room for um, the artwork that's in progress. Uh, so we'll sort of be expanding that um, and art classes will have plenty of room to function um, with, with six feet of distancing in place. When it comes to music, choir is relocating to the band room or an outdoor option, depending on the weather, and band is relocating to the stage. Um, so we've sort of upgraded um, those spaces to allow for more distancing. And I will say as well that Mr. Ifkiewicz has purchased um, a special choir mask. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone has seen these. They were selling them as part of a Broadway um, sort of fundraiser that was going on. Um, and so we do have some safety precautions in place, but Mr. Campion, if there's anything you wanna add for the performing arts uh, wing. And maybe. Uh Carl, what you might want to address, the one question was about airflow in the buildings, um, keeping windows open, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You might want to address that at the same time. Yes, we are, um, we are obviously making sure that the systems are optimized. Uh, all our um, uh, central systems do pull the 30% as mandated by, the, I think, the county regulations, 30% fresh air. And windows will be, um, yes, they will be open as much as possible to allow for fresh air. And we will follow the, I think, the ASHRAE and the CDC guidelines of starting the systems um, early, earlier than normal. Say, if, if classes start around 8, we will start running systems at 6 in the morning. Uh, as, as recommended. So yeah, we will pull in without overloading systems and causing failures, we will pull in as much fresh air as possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, was that was that both questions? Yeah, about... Um, and just in, in the, yes, we are spreading out as much as Mrs. Thiel said, as much as possible. 
I think uh, to put the chorus in the band room is an excellent idea because it is a much larger space. And uh, I know Mr. Demnicki uh, has a plan for the, the stage as well um, to, to spread that out uh, as much as possible, spread them out as much as possible. Question about um, just parking space. If more kids are gonna be driving as opposed to taking a bus, do we have sufficient parking for all of the, for all the cars, for the additional cars? I, I would have, I would jump in and say, my observation is the upper lot closest to Philadelphia Pike, there, there, there's unused space up there. Mm -hmm. It's I traditionally called the faculty lot, but I think Mr. Nawazik would have the, the flexibility to open up spaces up, up there for, um, for additional student drivers. Right. Um, just more clarification on the, on the mask types. Are just N95s with valves not allowed or any mask with a valve? That's a good question. I'll look that up. Yeah. <laughs> we can I, I, clarify for you, sure. Yeah, we, we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, uh, just another question. Uh, can you direct one parent about picking up things that might have been left from lockers from last year? Yes. Um, if all I would need is um, the locker number and the combination of the lock, and uh, either myself or someone who works with me in the summer will bring that to the main office. Uh, we'll respond to the email and we'll bring it to the main office. That's, that's not a problem at sure. all. Um, question about adaptations for master singers, the play, the musical, sort of the performing arts program. How might that be handled or are there initial ideas for around that? Well, I know that Mr. Manelski has been thinking through this a lot. Um, we have not yet talked in person about how those auxiliary programs will work but I am hoping that the Wednesday will actually be able to offer sort of more time for students to be in contact with club moderators and things of that nature. Um, so stay tuned for more information. I unfortunately do not have specifics when it comes to Master Singers or the fall production, which would sort of be the, our first two things that, that we would have. Um, but please know that, that we are, um, you know, obviously going to consider every, each, each individual program um, individually and thoroughly. Yeah, and I know Mr. I, I mean, he and I have chatted too, um, about, you know, the continuation of the choral groups and how that would be managed. I think he's coming up with some pretty creative ideas, just a little early to, he's still in the works with being creative, I think. A question about yearbooks, and I'm not sure specifically what that might be about, but I guess, you know, content or, or what that might look like or how the yearbooks might capture the year, so to speak. Yeah, there's, there's already been some, um, some ch talk about this, um, sort of chatter about this. Um, many of you might remember in the spring, there was a lot of sort of individual submissions of sort of life during COVID, life in, in sort of the day of, of an Archmere student um, and soliciting um, sort of more personalized photos. Uh, so I know that Ms. Palmer will be incredibly creative when it comes to that. Um, and obviously we'll wanna capture as much as we can on campus uh, as early as possible. Yeah. Question, uh, there are two questions. I don't want to lose the one question because um, there were two, two questions related to it. Um, driver's ed, while we're on course op and op 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 options, yeah. Sure, sure. And then maybe Dr. Marinelli, after I answer the driver's ed question, I have one pre-submitted question that I wanted to answer before we wrap up for the evening. Um, yeah, I do want to get to this other one question. Sure. And we are, we are planning a ring mass. Uh, that was a question that just jumped up. We'll get back to you about that. Um, so driver's ed, um, actually, Mr. Walsh uh, got the green light, no pun intended, um, to, to start driver's ed back up again. Um, and so he's actually been driving one-on-one -on -one with students with masks on, if that's um, something that your family feels comfortable doing. And then the course will be offered as usual. Um, it's going to be offered actually in the band room, if I remember the schedule correctly, um, to a, you know, a, a slightly larger group of students at one time so we can make sure that we hit all of those needs because um, we know that that's a game changer for a lot of families. Before Katie, you asked your last question. The one question was, and there were two questions, if a family feels that a child needs to be at home for the semester because of underlying health issues or whatever, is that a possibility? In other words, could someone do a remote semester? Yes. So um, that's, that's going to be the important part of remaining in contact with Mr. Nawazik regarding those needs. So if you're able to provide at least a window of time, that would be ideal. Obviously, we will be making modifications on the fly and, and will certainly be flexible. But please know that we're prepared for whatever, whatever works for your family. 
Yeah, so that would be, yes, th we would probably accommodate that. And uh, where do students put their coats when it gets cold? I think, are they gonna just have to carry them around, I guess, like I did in college or what? I don't know. On the back of the chair, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that might be it. Um, I think we tried to get to most of the answers. I, I apologize if I skipped over anyone's question, but of course you can always, you know, send us an email directly. Um, but I know that the, it, it, they kept jumping around on my screen. So. <laughs> and know that the, the frequently asked questions will be posted um, hopefully by early next week. I did just want to follow up with one final question because it was a really good one that I received in advance. Um, what is the plan for school if we do have to go virtual? Um, our schedule has been created um, to pivot very easily. So we will still maintain um, the same course offerings. And obviously this year, um, you know, we've got a little bit more experience under our belts and that should certainly serve us well if that's the option that we need to go with. Though we're certainly hopeful that we'll be able to, to extend our in-person instruction as much as possible. So I apologize if we didn't get to all of your questions, um, but please know that I'll be downloading this report after the fact and we'll certainly take those into account as I uh, craft the frequently asked questions. You can then stay tuned for those on the COVID-19 page on the resources board of my Archmere. And then the last um, communication is just to, to check your email tomorrow that will have um, essentially this sort of checklist of items. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly before we finish up. Um, so this checklist is sort of the guide for families. So we're asking you to procure a temporal thermometer, make sure your son or daughter is stocked up on masks, download both the Sage app and the Magnus app. Again, more information to come on the Magnus app. And then to read through the entirety of the document, discuss it the family and sign that acknowledgement form and send that back in to the main office. Um, so thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, we will be in touch soon with more details um, and very grateful for your time.